Now, what Australia has, well, just to introduce some of the characters involved, is basically light bombers. We don't actually have any true fighter aircraft in our Air Force at the moment. Super Hornet's too heavy to survive in combat now and should be tasked to delivering anti-ship cruise missiles out at sea, which is another big hole in our force structure. And if you want to see the background of, uh, well, the background to the um, Super Hornet was that in the 1990s, the US Navy had a problem. Their A6 intruders were worn out. They had to get a new light bomber. But that was a time of the peace dividend when the you know, Soviet Union fell apart, so they didn't have the budget to do a proper aircraft. So they simply upsized the ordinary Hornet by 25% and didn't have enough money to do proper testing of the design. Uh, so the inner pylons of the Super Hornet are canted out at four degrees to stop the bombs on release from hitting the aircraft. And that increases the drag of the aircraft by 3%, and thus its range is reduced by 3%. But for further detail, I refer you to that government uh, GAO, which is Government Accountability Office in the US. They put a report out in... 1998, and um, it says we'll provide marginal operating improvement at high cost. And if you see the details, the Super Hornet turns at a much lower rate than the ordinary Hornet, and has much lo lower acceleration rate. On to the F-35. <laughs> this is a dog which will suck the, all the money out of our Defence Department prior to the submarines turning up, of course and then get shot out of the sky in combat. It's a triumph of marketing over reality. Now, what this is the main high-end uh, aircraft of the Russians and the Chinese now. The Chinese have bought 36 of these, the Su-35, of the whole um, flanker class. It's got a, it's a very large aircraft, 11 half tonnes of internal fuel, which is more than the dry weight of the Gripen. But the Gripen will see the uh, Su-35 much earlier than the Su-35 will see the Gripen. And this is what I believe is the best, cost, most cost-efficient solution to aerial defence at the moment, the Saab Gripen E. It's made from military off-the-shelf components, and the engine is the GE414, which is also used by the Super Hornet. That's what it looks like in plan view. And it's made from components all over North America and uh, Europe. The gun is a German gun. As I said, the engine is the GE engine. Now, into some of the details. Now, in fighter aircraft, cost is basically proportional to weight. Uh, and usually the engine is about 20% of the total cost and that's been muddied a bit in recent years because electronics have become such a large chunk of the cost of an aircraft that they're chucked into. But what you see here is the Gribbon on the left, dry weight of about 9 tonnes, as opposed to the F-22 with a dry weight of 22 tonnes. The F-35 in the middle, dry weight of 13 tonnes and it's Maximum takeoff weight is almost the weight of a B-29 bomber of World War II with six crew. Now this, the most famous uh, US aerial tactician was a bloke called John Boyd, who is famous for the UDA loop, the orientation, observation, decision, action in military affairs. Uh, he was a famous pilot. The Marine Corps in the US has a um, memorial to him, even though he never served in the Marines, but basically changed their philosophy so much. Anyway, there's a bloke called Pierre Spray in 1982 who put together the rules of aerial combat as proposed by John Boyd. And I've made this in a more read readable format, which is surprise without being surprised, outnumbering the air, which means you have to have a lower purchase cost, have a lower maintenance cost, lower operating cost per hour. You've got to outmaneuver to gain a firing position and out, outlast the enemy, which means having a high fuel road, which um, in everything to do with um, designing fighter aircraft and aircraft in general, everything's a trade-off. So if you make the fuel load higher, that increases the drag, for instance. 
and you've got to carry enough missiles and rounds for the gun, which becomes important, as we'll see. Now, we, we signed a contract for the uh, F-35 over 20 years ago now. And at that time, when the program was still run by people who had the military experience in the, in the first instance, uh, the bloke running the program said that the Joint Strike Fighter, which is the F-35, was designed 70% air-to-ground and 30% air-to-air. It's basically its role was to come in and bomb the Russian SAM sites after the F-22s had shot down the Russian Air Force. And this is all driven by the experience of the Yom Kippur War of 1973, when the Israelis were sending uh, aircraft up against the Syrians, for instance, and they're being shot down by the Syrian SAM systems, one after the other. And so the lesson the US got from that was, you've got to take out the SAM systems. So they made a dual structure where the F-22 provided top cover and the, after three days of the war, the F-35s would come in and take at the SAM sites with their two 2,000 pound bombs. Now it is a light bomber. It's not really a pure fighter aircraft. In fact, one of these people running the program in the US Air Force 15 years ago said that any F-35 that engages in air-to-air -air combat has made a mistake. And that's seen in the design. The Gripen, for instance, has its infrared search and track sensor on the top of the nose, facing at the sky and up ahead. And the F-35 is looking at the ground, because what it wants to do is to see the ground in great detail and drop its bombs accurately. And it's sold as a stealth aircraft and fifth generation. At my table, we brought up the subject of generations of aircraft, which is something that Lockheed Martin invented in the early 2000s. And one of their criteria for being fifth generation was the ability of supercruise, that is to go supersonic without using afterburner. Well, that was dropped as a criteria in the fifth air, uh, generation aircraft when the F-35 couldn't supercruise actually. It has it struggles mightily to get through the sound barrier. Uh, in fact, it didn't um, get up to its full speed of Mach 1.6 until five years into the flying program. And basically what this sets, says at the moment is that he who emits dies. So people don't fly around with their radars on all the time anymore. Let's go into some more of the detail. Combat and manoeuvrability, which get back to, to Boyd's protocols for fighter aircraft. So this, the graph you see there, on the x-axis, plots up thrust loading, which is the um, weight of the aircraft divided by the, the thrust of the engines, and the, and the wing loading. And you want, where you want to be is in the bottom left-hand corner. Of course, we've got the two dogs up in the bottom, top right-hand corner, who will produce all the widows. <laughs> Rate of climb and rate of and thrust. Dry thrust on the right on the x-axis and rate of climb on the left axis. They all plot up in a straight line basically. But the bigger the aircraft, it actually the more efficient the engines become and you get a higher rate of climb. 2008, Rand Corporation did a, a report on a war with China and the role of the F-35 in that. Quite a famous report. And both afterwards, uh, Lockheed got both of the authors fired. One ended up in Northrop. But anyway, that's famous for producing the um, aphorism that the F-35 can't turn, can't climb, can't run. And you may remember back in the mid-2000s, it was said that the F-35 will be clubbed like baby seals in combat. Then this is why it will come to pass. This is a sustained rate of turn on the x-axis and thrust to weight ratio on the y-axis, and where you want to be is in the top right-hand corner, not in the bottom left-hand corner, where the F-35 and the F-18 sit. Bear in mind that we, Australia, has made dreadful decisions in fighter aircraft decisions in the past. In World War II, we produced the Wirraway trainer, and there were 700 produced. Some were sent into combat. Though all those Wirraways only shot down one Japanese fighter. There was a Wirraway that suddenly found itself about a thousand foot above a, a uh, zero and dived on it and shot it down, but that's the only instance of a Wirraway shooting down another aircraft. Now, so we, our RWF establishment can send our pilots into deadly danger 
um, because they chose the wrong aircraft. There's a historic record of that. Now what this shows is instantaneous turn rate per second, sustained turn rate per second. And the better fighters in the top right hand corner and the F-35 and the F-18 in the bottom down the left hand corner. If you've got an increase in sustained turn rate of two degrees, you will dominate a turning engagement. And it's said that stealth is all important. Well, this is a German typhoon from the Red Flag Alaska exercise in 2012. And just behind the pilot, you can see three F-22 symbols that in theory shot down three F-22s in this uh, Red Flag exercise by the time this photograph was taken. They're all much the same, actually, the F-22, the Typhoon, Rafael, and the Gripen in terms of their combat efficacy. Cost per copy. Now, this is pretty uh, recent. The F-22, once it was obvious that the F-35 was a dog, some of the US people in the US Congress decided, well, let's restart F-22 production. And at the time, you could get the weight of the F-22 and calculate what it cost, and it was 205 billion US per copy. So the idea was dropped. But that's basically pretty accurate. The Rafale and the Typhoon are actually around the 200 million euro mark, which is 200 million US. And this is capital cost per copy of aircraft versus operating cost per hour. And this is a little dated in that um, data came out a couple of weeks ago that in 2020, the F-22's operating cost was 84,000 US per hour. Now, at the other end of the scale, about 10 years ago, it was said that the Gripen's operating cost was 7,000 US per hour. It may be higher than that, maybe something like 10. Um, cost per hour per month of flying time. So why that's important is in peacetime is that for a fighter pilot to be proficient in his aircraft, they need 20 hours a month of flying time. It can't all be simulator. So based on the previous operating cost, it's about 1.2 million US a month to keep an F-22 pilot proficient in flying the F-22. Probably more than that now. And the Gripen's down under 200,000 US. Now sortie rate. Now this is an historic graph from Pierre Spray's 1982 uh, report. But what it shows time on the right, on the x-axis, from 1950 up to 1980, sorties per day per million dollars spent uh, per aircraft. And as you can see, it was very cheap to operate fighter aircraft back in the 50s, and then the asymptote was about 1960, and then it's become progressively more expensive per hour. Now, supposing you had to defend Australia with fighter aircraft and you're given a billion US dollars to spend on the aircraft, what would you get per fighter type? So based on what we understand the Gripen's price is, you get almost 14 Gripen's for a billion US and just under five F30, uh, F-22s. The best way to get air superiority is to get more aircraft of equal capa capa capability for the same outlay. <laughs> You look at the sortie rate of those different aircraft, and this is how many sorties you can get per day per your billion dollars spent. So the Gripen has a 15 minute turnaround time, and you probably get half a dozen a day out of it. The F 35 and the F 22 will fly every second day, and much other aircraft are in between. Now, the first people in Australia to say our F 35 purchase is going to be a dog were Air Power Australia, two blokes in Melbourne, Carlo Kopp and Peter Goon, who simply looked at the aerodynamics of the thing and said, no, it's too draggy, it's a dog. And this data is from them, and it's their predicted loss exchange rate of various fighter aircraft, US fighter aircraft, against the uh, Su-35. So above the line, the SU-35 is losing, and below the line, the SU-35 is winning. By their calculations, uh, a Gripen will shoot down 1.6 SU-35s per Gripen shot down. The F-22 is about 
SU-35s shot down by each SU-35. F-35, about three lost per SU-35, and the FA-18s, about eight to one, shot down by the SU-35. So when you calculate it out, Gripen can shoot down the FA-18 Hornet, Super Hornet, at a rate of about 20 to one. One Gripen lost per 20 Super Hornet shot down. And this is another fragment of a US Air Force document saying that, what's well, a Navy document, saying that um, the F-18 Super Hornets were a powerful instrument for precision strike in a non-contested operating environment. So we can't let all that out. A dollar spent on the Gripen provides 20, 20 times the combat efficacy of a dollar spent on the F-35. Let's talk about some of the um, combat attributes. Now, it's said the F-35 is optimised for flying at 20,000 feet, where it can see the ground better and drop its bombs. The SU-35 flies up around about 60,000 feet, if, where the F-22 flies, um, the Gripen's up there also. Super Hornet's possibly a 40,000 foot flighter. It, it doesn't have the power to fly at a higher, higher altitude. That means any missile fired from the uh, F-35 has to climb at least 25,000 feet up towards where the SU-35 is flying, and it shorts its range dramatically. It also increases the dynamic range of the, of the SU-35 missiles. Now, up next is SU-57. The Russians might not have much money at the moment, but they might build some more of these. It's possibly the most manoeuvrable fighter ever built. It's got some low observability. It's not speckled up with RAM as the F-22 and the F-35 are. Now, you're not supposed to be able to protect this thing on radar, so um, how you would fight it, if you're supported by Jorn and the joint tenderly over the radar horizon um, network, it could see the um, SU-57 because it operates at a different frequency. Stealth is about to expand. And that would reduce the box that the SU-57 is flying in down about a cubic kilometre, in which case then you'd switch to uh, be able to use um, infrared search and track to find out where it is. If you use a medium missile, which is a range of 200 kilometres, and put an infrared seeker on the front end, as opposed to a radar seeker, then that would even it up and you'd still have a good ex loss exchange rate against the SU-57 by using the Gripen E. Combat radius. Um, yeah, we've got an F-35 base at Tyndall, just south of Darwin, and that's its range. SU-35 has got a range of 1,600 kilometres. Gripen E is about 1,500 kilometres. Bear in mind that in World War II, 80 years ago, Japanese Zeros taking off from Kupang strafed the Exmouth radar station and return to Kupang. Up cost, capital cost and operating cost over the Lee craft life. So with most, a lot of military systems, your operating cost over the life of the, um, <coughs> whatever you're using is about twice your capital cost of buying it. And that's true of fighter aircraft, or it has been, while they had low flight hours built into them at six or 8,000 hours. The F-15EX is being built with a 20,000 hour life in the frame now, which will put these out but the reason this slide is up to show, there's your cost of an aircraft, say it was 100 mil, you're going to spend 200 mil over the life of the aircraft on operating it. But because you've got it, if you have a twin engine, you're going to spend another 20 or 30 percent per annum as opposed to a single engine. Which means over the life of the uh, aircraft, you're spending equivalent to about 50 percent of your original capital cost for having a, a second engine in the aircraft. Therefore, you have to, should ask yourself whether you do really need it or not. And this is US aircraft, US Air Force uh, statistics from the decade 1993 to 2002. Fatalities, destroyed aircraft, and Class A mishaps over those 10 years. If you see the power plant, which is the engine on the right hand end, uh, the fatality rate is lower than that of what, uh, bird strikes. A bit equivalent to taxing accidents. Um, it used to be that jet engines were unreliable. 
and things would fall out of the sky, but they're very reliable these days, they're properly maintained. Basing's not a trivial consideration. The trouble with the F-35, it needs a long runway. They actually haven't officially said how long the runway needs to be to operate an F-35. But when they based training for the F-35 in Williamstown in Newcastle, the length of the aircraft, uh, air runway had to be lengthened from 8,000 feet to 10,000 feet to give the pilots the option to abort a takeoff. And 10,000 feet is the, the territory of, of large bombers in terms of the air, uh, airfield required. As opposed to there are thousands of strips around Australia that take, could take Fokker aircraft, there's thousands of kilometres of straight stretches of road which could take aircraft if you had an aircraft that could land on them. <coughs> so this is a graph showing cumulatively Australia's uh, then listed airfields, 428. There's only 25 that can handle F-35 in terms of length of the aircraft. There are only five of those in Northern Australia where supposedly we're going to have any battles with these aircraft are going to fight. There's only one base set up to take the F-35 in terms of maintenance because it requires its own air conditioning and its own power supply. And a big problem with the F-35 is that if it sits on the runway in the middle of summer in the northern Australia and soaks up heat, it may not take off again if the fuel's too hot. Now, the US Air Force they first encountered this over 12 years ago. At Nellis Air Force Base, they ended up painting the water trucks white and kept them under a water spray so that the fuel wouldn't heat up. So when they put the fuel in the F-35, the F-35 would start. Bear in mind that they use the fuel for cooling the electronics. So when the RAAF started basing F-35s up at Tyndall in the Northern Territory, it was a big surprise to them that they wouldn't take off sometimes because the fuel would become too hot. Which means that if you have an F-35 flying around and it wants to land in Kununurra, for instance, uh, and it sits on the, air, you know, on the airstrip for too long, it may not take off again. And how do you get it cooled down? Whether they've actually thought about it, whether you can have to keep emergency supply of carbon, you know, dry ice or something in Tyndall and fly it in and pack it around the aircraft to cool it down. Because I've been in the Northern Territory and it stays at 40 degrees centigrade overnight some nights, if you camped out. Uh, it's an absolute disaster, which means that for an enemy, all you have to do is attack Tyndall, make sure that the uh, runway is not usable for a while, and our F-35s can't take off. More on the F-35. Uh, so they mixed the software for the avionics in with the software for the uh, weapon systems, which means that every time you change a weapon or add a new weapon to the thing, the whole thing has to be sorted out at great expense. Uh, bear in mind that... Uh, Lockheed has control in the US, has control of the uh, software running the F-35. The only other country that's allowed to access the software and change it itself is Israel. And no one else can change it, uh, which means that we're at the mercy of Lockheed if we make our own air-to-air -air missiles and, and add them to this thing with any other characteristics. Now, the fact that Israel has some F-35s is due to the fact of the Camp David Accords they get three billion US a year from the United States, which they spend on US weapon systems. Egypt's got the same deal. That's why they have so many M1 tanks. And one year the Yanks said to them, you're taking F-35s, you get no choice in the matter. And the Israelis said, we need access to the software. And they did get it. And it actually surprisingly has been successful in Israeli service. But I show it in another slide here coming that the Israelis exclusively use it for heavy reconnaissance. They don't use it for air to air combat. Um, anyway, the software is a big problem. Oh, there's another matter associated with that. That when the aircraft lands, the data from the flight is downloaded and has to be sent to Fort Worth, to a Lockheed facility in Fort Worth. And there's gigabytes of data involved from each flight. And that's why Lockheed want to keep control of the spare supply. Uh, they want to gouge you and every part of the whole chain from initial buying of the thing to maintenance to spare supply. Countries aren't encouraged to stockpile their own spares. You're supposed to take it from a common pool. So what happens at a war? 
is that the US Air Force will, will have first dibs on whatever spares are available, and we at the other end of the planet uh, will have cannibalising whatever is available to keep the remaining ones flying at that time. But anyway, back to the, uh, soft, the um, flight data. It's downloaded, sent to Fort Worth. And uh, then the US Navy realised, well, now, bear in mind, if you, if you didn't do this, the plane might stop flying after about a month um, if it detected that its data wasn't being downloaded. Anyway, this back to its characteristics F-35. As I've shown in the previous slides, all our fighter fighters have higher sustained turn rates. It's also useless near the ground. It's like flying a, a, a rock with tiny wings. You've got to pull out the strafing run too early before you can get close to whatever you're trying to shoot at. There is no date for set for in initial operating capability test. All the aircraft we're being bought and we're buying are all pre-production models. They may not get into full rate production and everything that's been produced to date will be an orphan. There was a similar situation in the early 60s, once again with Lockheed, the F-104 Starfighter. That was a time when it's thought that um, fighter aircraft should be as fast as possible. And they made this thing with tiny wings. Um, it's very sharp. All the, the wings were actually razor sharp on the air edge to make it as fast as possible. It was fast, but it, it was absolutely dog on the aircraft and couldn't handle and uh, required a very high landing speed. Anyway, um, German Defence Minister took a 10 million US bribe from Lockheed. The Germans bought hundreds of them and it was ended up being called the Widowmaker. So basically, history repeating itself after 50 years. The US Air Force was under Donald Trump. The US Air Force was suddenly told by the Defence Department, you're buying F-15s. Now, they didn't have any part in the decision. So there's an, a model of the F-15, first flew in 1972, called the 1515EX, and um, they may end up buying 400 of them or more. It varies between the warring factions within the US uh, Congress and military about how much money gets allocated to what. The F-15 is a Boeing aircraft and, and the F-35 is a Lockheed aircraft. If the Israeli Air Force would rather buy more F-15s. Oh, the bomb bay of the F-35s is at 100 degrees centigrade and cooking the electronics of everything it carries within it. And the F-35 flying under 20,000 feet has to open its bomb bay doors every 20 minutes to let out the excess heat. And how do we know that's true? Because with this ad for an anti-ship cruise missile by a company called Kongsberg out of Norway. Now, what Kongsberg did, they said, well, the F-35's coming along, there'll be thousands sold. It's got a little short bomb bay, which no existing uh, anti-ship cruise missile can fit into. So if you make one that fits into the bomb bay of the F-35, we'll dominate the market. And so they did, and they produced this thing, little thing, but quite a good missile, actually. And in, under avionics, you'll see the second item, thermal management system for 30 F-35 internal bay conditions. And by internal bay, they mean bomb bay. Uh, so it sucks the heat out of the of the uh, missile to keep the electronics at the right temperature while it's sitting in the F-35's bomb bay. And uh, over Christmas I heard of a bloke who baked his turkey for seven hours at 100 degrees centigrade to keep it moist. So you could theoretically cook meals in the F-35's bomb bay. More on the F-35's attributes. Uh, this is from a US Air Force pilot. So most aircraft and all fighter aircraft have nicknames. What do you think the nickname of the F-35 is? Is it fearsome commie killer? Or, or something of that? No, they call it a fat Amy, actually. And that's what they think of it themselves. And in his words, it's little value as an air superior uh, aircraft as it carries almost no missiles in its stealth configuration. Bear in mind, in, uh, it was designed to carry two 2,000 pound bombs into combat, and they added uh, two AIM-120 missiles, you know, radar guided missiles. The gun is useless, as it creates a massive amount of drag on the gun side of the aircraft. 
It's got extremely poor air time to magnet time ratio and low payload capacity in stealth configuration. And its sole area of ex actual expertise is heavy reconnaissance. And the Israelis use the F-16 uh, for heavy strike and the F-15 for air-to-air -air work. Another thing, uh, the innards of the F-35 are packed tighter than a head of cabbage. Because of the weight constraint in trying to get the F-35B, the vertical takeoff and landing thing working, and they had to make the frame and everything as small as possible. And to get the criteria of the range required to win the contract back in the 90s, they've now got 11 fuel tanks in the F-35. So every little crook and panny's got a fuel tank in it. It'll be like the um, Mitsubishi G4M of the modern era. You, that, you remember that as the Betty bomber, which the Japs made 3,000 of in World War II as a torpedo bomber and a 3,000 on the range. But to get that range, they took out the um, rubber lining of the fuel tanks. So the thing would burn as soon as it hit, and its nickname was a cigarette lighter. And there's the same philosophy in the design of the F-35. And this one happens when you try to refuel it in the air. The US Air Force is very much a tanker, you know, aerial tanker sort of air force, and um, they've got hundreds of them. Well, well, long story short, because of all those fuel tanks within it and the necessity to keep the um, centre of gravity in the same place, while it's taking fuel in from the tanker, it's got to pump around fuel within itself, and it's calculated by the computer where to pump the fuel to. So it takes six minutes to refuel a single F-35. So if you have a flight of four, and bear in mind the US philosophy now is that you have a minimum flight of four, so they have enough missiles uh, to have a go at anything coming along. Um, it takes half an hour to refuel it, which is a great chunk of time, the thing to be sitting around in one orbit. Mission capable rates of the US Air Force, French Air Force Royal over the Typhoon and Rafael. Um, you can see they're in the 60s. The F-22, as of 2021, was down at 51% mission capable. But there's some more detail here on pure US Air Force uh, aircraft. 21, finally you got 2020 versus 21. You can see um, F-22 is still at 51%. And let's go on to the B-1B. When I started looking at fighter aircraft, seven or eight years ago. The B-1 bomber had an operating cost of 60,000 US an hour. It was an absolute bargain for that bomb load and being supersonic and everything. But it's now three times that, 180,000 US an hour. It had a planned life of 30 years and it's now up to 36 years. And this is US fighter bomber operating cost per hour in 2020. Also the fleet size. So as at 2020, there were 231 F-35As, an average age of 3.8 years, and an operating cost of 42,000 US per hour. So given the current exchange rate, that's 60,000 Aussie an hour to keep an F-35 in the air. And we will have a look at this graph because it shows the evolution of operating costs over time from 2011 up to 2020. You can see the F-22 is up the top there, very expensive to operate. The US actually can't afford them. Um, the F-18 A's and D's from the US Navy have come through the pack and they're actually more expensive at 54,000 an hour to operate than the F-35s. It just being worn out from all those landings over 30, 40 years, they can't get rid of them fast enough. But actually the F-18, you can see the EF there and the CDs, F-15s. We'll go into the bombers and pure bombers themselves. See, the B-2 is stable at around uh, 180,000 US per hour, but the B-1's come up to it. Um, but bear in mind the B-1 has to be kept in an air-conditioned hangar, and you have to keep maintaining its RAM coating, and that's why it's one of the reasons why it's so expensive. There are not that many of them left, actually. The B-52, sits there around about 80,000 an hour, which is good. Now, 
In the last month, a couple of reports came out of the US, one out of the Government Accountability Office and one out of the Congressional, Congressional Budget Office. I can't remember which this one is, but they're obviously trying to send us a signal, or at least to the US establishment, a signal. This is a report on the S a diagram out of a report on the Super Hornet, which is in the bottom left hand corner. This is availability versus age of the aircraft fleet on average. And the Super Hornet's dropping away relatively rapidly, relative to other things. The F 15s stand out as the most reliable long term uh, aircraft to own. Once again, this is flying hours per month. F-16s are uh, dropping out. Uh, the F-16 C and Ds are doing well enough. The A-10 I wouldn't count. It's basically an aerial target in this day and age. And the F-15Es are, are holding up. But they're only getting about 15 hours per month out of the F-22s. Now, you th if you think I've been a bit harsh on the F-35, this is from out of one of those documents. This is full mission availability rates of the F-35 from 2% availability over 30 years. Uh, the F-22 is around about the 50% mark and the F-35 is now lower than the F-22 at less than five years of age. It doesn't bode well for availability. So what messed up the US Air Force actually was a peace dividend from the 1990s when they stopped buying aircraft, they were buying F-15s and F-16s at a furious rate, as you'll see in another graph coming up. And then the F-22 came along and Robert Gates uh, cut it short at around about 187 built. And he said the Chinese won't have a stealth fighter until the 2020s and all that happened. The Chinese have got a pseudo stealth fighter now. But he stopped um, F-22 production because they think they were all going to be irregular wars from here and no peer-to-peer -peer wars. But it was actually a good decision because the F-22 was actually self-defeated by its own radar absorbent material coating, which is the reason why it costs so much to fly. But what you see on this graph, average age of each aircraft fleet in years. So there's a B-52 in the bottom right-hand corner. There's about 80 of them left and an average age of 60, this is in 2021. Then the A-10 is actually quite an old thing. There's a very small B-1 fleet, it's very expensive to fly. F-16 is actually the mainstay of the US Air Force. The F-15E at around 25 years. A tiny little fleet of B-2s. The F-22, which is they're gonna retire as fast as they can. Now I should say at this point that there's a couple of black programs coming along in the US Department of Defense. The Air Force has got one called Next Generation Air Dominance, and it is the replacement for the F-22. It first flew about four or five years ago. Uh, there's been no photos of it available in the press. I don't know what it looks like, um, but it's gonna be very expensive. They're alerting the US public to sticker shock, possibly the 300 million US per copy. The US Navy has now got a budget item for a flight program, a black program, in excess of one billion US per annum for the next four or five years, which is telling us that they've also got a prototype fighter aircraft, which they're making copies of. That's why they're spending so much money on it and flying them, probably at night, so they don't get photographed by satellites and all that sort of thing, as they did with F-117 when that was developed. So it's not as doomy and gloomy, except it will be very expensive. Um, it's possibly not the most cost-efficient solutions is to have an exquisite uh, aircraft you've only got a handful of. Let's go back to history now. The F-35 was born of a Yak, uh, specifically the Yak 141. Lockheed Martin in the early 90s, when they wanted to dominate US fighter aircraft production to the end of time, thought, well, how we'll do it is we'll appeal to the US Marine Corps. The US Marines got abandoned at Henderson on Golden Canal, was it 1942 or something? And um, it's been a, tra it was a traumatic experience for them. The US Navy, after that big loss they had in the slot, sailed off in the night and left them alone facing the Japanese. And after that, they vowed to have their own air force. Now, they liked the Harrier because it was 
take off and landing remotely. Uh, so they bought their own version of that, the AV-8. And when the F-35 came up, well, actually, let's go back to Lockheed Martin, said, well, how we'll sell this aircraft is it will have commonality across the three services and we'll have a vertical takeoff landing version for the Marines and because everybody likes the Marines, Congress will approve it. And, but that vertical takeoff landing capability was original sin of the F-35 and most of the poor design decisions were to allow that to happen, with the vertical takeoff and landing aspect. And where they got the technology from was the Act 141. I hope you can see it on there at the back of the aircraft with a split tail, you'll see the engine nozzle facing down. That was because a particular Russian admiral wanted vertical takeoff and landing supersonic fighter. And this was the first one ever created. And Lockheed in 91 did a deal with the Yakolov Design Bureau and they funded the, the Yak-141 to flight Farnborough in 1992. And when the F-35 flew in Farnborough in 2016, after finally making it across the Atlantic, uh, the Yak-141 was forgotten, but it basically did the same routines that the Yak-141 did decades before. Now let's go on to some specifics and the enormous costs of having that vertical takeoff and landing capability, starting with the engine. So the thrust specific fuel consumption of the F-135 engine of the F-35 is 0.8889 pounds of fuel per hour per pound of thrust generated. If you look at the engines of the F-15 and the F-16, which is the um, Pratt & Whitney 229, it's 0.726 pounds of fuel per hour per pound of thrust produced, which is 18.5% lower. Somehow you've got a, a more recent aircraft that chews 80.5% more fuel. Why would that be? It's because for the vertical takeoff landing to happen, bear in mind in a runway like this, an aircraft starts trundling down the, air, the runway, it picks up speed, there's a ram effect of air is forced into the engine. That doesn't happen. Uh, in the F-35 hovering, it's got to suck in an enormous amount of still air at full afterburner and support the weight of the aircraft on that pillar of fire from the full afterburner, which means that you have an enormous mass of air in order to generate that thrust, which means that all the F-35 variants have this wide, draggy, thirsty engine. Also on a history meme, this is the granddad of the F uh, F-35, the Yak-38, it looks a bit like a Harrier. That panel that comes up at the front on the hydraulic arm, that has two little uh, jet engines that provide thrust at the front end and that the uh, same with the 141. If we go back further in time, back in the 1930s, if you spend your time going through German patent applications from the 1930s, you'll eventually come across this diagram which is the original concept for a vertical and takeoff landing that could operate in forward flight. And what it is, you see one, two and three are pulse jet engines. And this thing could then theoretically take off and, and then the uh, propeller would take over and go forward. So the true intellectual heritage of the F-35 is from Nazi Germany by way of the Soviet Union. I don't think it's possible to get a more evil intellectual heritage than the F-35. And this is the F-35B. Uh, in an infrared, and that's at full afterburner to support the weight of the aircraft, which also means that everything underneath has to be protected against this uh, enormous blast of, of hot air. How did the F-35 get so far? Well, it almost died a few times, but it was going to die in 2015, until a bloke called James Dunford, who was a super, um, running the US Marine Corps at the time, declared in initial operating capability when this thing could hardly move at all, take off. Lockheed Martin at the time expected it to die, but um, that decision by the Marine Corps kept it alive, all three variants. Four months, 11 days after retiring, he ended up being uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He joined the Lockheed Martin board. Now, US law stops a defence contractor from joining uh, from a US retired the military from joining a defence contractor for four months after retirement. He waited, they waited another 11 days. 
But it means his bum will never sit on commercial aircraft. He'll be on one of Lockheed Martin's Gulf Streams. This is the history of US fighter aircraft production, 1975, and a bit of a projection down to 2030. As you can see, when the Cold War was on and Reagan was in charge, they produced a lot of F-15s, A-10s, F-16s. Not much produced in the 90s, and that's where a big age out comes from. The F-22 production cut mercifully short. F-35, another bad decision. And the purple in the bottom right-hand corner is the F-15 production, resuming again after 50 years. So it'll be inspiring for all of us here. And NGAD coming along as an unknown. Okay, we, also, we know so far that the F-35 drinks fuel at 80% greater rate than it should do. But Pratt and Whitney, to make the engine as light enough as possible, so to enable the vertical takeoff and landing, also made it lighter than it could, should be. They also went to the bleeding edge of technology and beyond in terms of the engine temperature that the uh, thing runs on. So the inlet temperature for the F-119 engine of the F-22, and bear in mind that the F-35's engine is based on the core of the engine in the F-22. They simply redesigned it a bit, same engine. And the F-22, the inlet temperature behind the combustors, in front of the, the last stage of turbines is 1,649 degrees centigrade. In the F-35, it's 1,982 degrees centigrade which is 333 degrees centigrade higher than the F-22's inlet temperature, which is half the devil's number. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. The F-35 engine, um, but if you look at the, with the turbine blades, they start melting at 1427 degrees centigrade, which is several hundred degrees lower than the inlet temperature. And how they stop from melting is air forced through a lot of holes in the turbine blades. All that's well and good. The F-35 first flew in 2006, but then, 2021, we started seeing headlines like this. New engines as soon as 2027. May not be able to afford a F new F-35 engine. Pentagon is exploring its options for a more efficient, powerful F-35 engine. Suddenly, the F-35 needed a new engine. But none of these articles tell us why. Until we get to this Government Accountability Office report released in April 2022. DOD faces several uncertainties as has not met key objectives on F-35 sustainment. And it's got a graph in the bottom left-hand corner there showing uh, from 2022 to early 2020, 2020 to early 2022, number of F-35s without an engine. How could they lose their engine? They're up to 36 uh, in February 2022. Well, this is the explanation. Now, normally, the US Air Force, only 1% of aircraft don't have an engine at any one time. But for F-35, that r r rose at 10% in 2022. It was on trend to be 43% by 2030, 20, 2030. And what it is, because their engine runs so hot, that dust that the engine's taking in uh, melts and gets stuck to the turbine blades downstream. So there's a layer of stuff that looks, you know, it's like house bricks, builds up on the turbine blades and needs to be taken off, needs to be scraped off. That wasn't in the budget. Uh, it takes a long time, you need to set up new facilities. Now I will say that they've got this under control now and to some extent and the number of F-35s without an engine has dropped as they've changed their um, budgeting priorities. But we're not told about that here. Uh, What's happened since? Well, let's go back to the details of it. We can pull the data apart. So what this graph shows is engine weight in kilos for various fighter aircraft on the x-axis, increasing to the right, the dry thrust in pounds. We don't mind mixing metric and, and um, imperial units in our graphs. Most of those plot around the bottom, the F-22 and the F-35 are a, a bit above trend. The F-35 engine weighs 4% less than the F-22's engine, but puts out 8% more dry thrust, which tells me that they sacrificed stiffening in it. And the problem with that in a fighter aircraft, if you go into a snap turn, there are enormous gyroscopic forces in a jet engine, and it wants to keep going in the straight line in the direction it was going. And if you put these enormous forces on it, uh, then it bends. And that's what happened to an F-35 at a US Air Force base in Florida about 10 years ago now, that it had about three seconds in a turn, 
and uh, aircraft landed. <laughs> Two weeks later, it was taking off again, it was taxiing, and the engine blew up, simply because the uh, rotor blades had gouged into the housing it was in. What this graph shows is bypass ratio by engine. And for most fighter aircraft, it's much the same, around about 30 to 40 per cent. The F-35 uh, engine's approaching 60 per cent. Why would that be? It enables them to produce an enormous amount of much more wet thrust. You're throwing a lot more air through the engine, the outside, and uh, for that few moments of the F-35B's flight regime, when it's doing an up and down thing, the whole fleet, over its whole time, is penalised uh, with a fuel penalty. So what this shows is engine weight in kilos, as in wet thrust in pounds, and you see the F-35 takes off from the F-22. And this is our this, uh, 13th of March, just a couple of weeks ago, the, F30, uh, the US Air Force abandoned a new engine in favour of upgrades to the existing engine. Considering the things at the bleeding edge already, uh, they might be able to make it with more materials over the last 20 years, but I doubt it. What it means for us as a little Air Force with 72 coming of them, this is a, um, an article from the Australian, and it says in uh, flying hours, for our then 33 F-35s cut by 36%. Because the RWF must have believed the Lockheed marketing, that the operating cost of thing, this thing was going to be 25,000 US an hour. Turned out it was more like 38,000 US an hour. So instead of increasing the budget so that we get 20 hours per month, they simply reduced the flying hours per month for our pilots from 20 down to 13. Now bear in mind you need a minimum of 20 to maintain proficiency. So it's a bad outcome. And what the US f has found is that the accident rate starts going up once your uh, flying hours go under 20 hour month. Yet, wait, there's more. This is the output from a US Air Force think tank called, well, let's go first up, the then acting Secretary of Defence of the US in January 2001 called the F-35 a piece of shit in a public meeting. Now, now he gets access to more data than an article that I do, but he come to that conclusion. But they also have a think tank called the Warfighting Integration Capability Office, which in 2018 said that the US Air Force fleet should be reduced from 1763 down to 1050. But the role they were going to give the F-35 in any future war will be to carry to two JAM, JASM um, 158s, up to the edge of the defended zone, drop those and then run away. Nothing to do with combat. Uh, bear in mind that those things are 4.27 metres long and the F-35's bomb bay is 3.65 metres long. So they'd be sitting out the wings, completely compromised to stealth. And that was the whole point of the aircraft in the first place, was being stealthy. Percentage of US Air Force F-35s that can't fly due to a lack of parts from 2018 to 2022. It's around about 25%. Because they don't feel like funding a higher rate of part supply, so they'll put up with having 25% being unable to fly at any one time due to a lack of parts. And of course, we're at the far end, another 16,000 kilometres away from where the parts originate. This is a photograph taken on the USS Carl Vincent of some F-35Cs. Now, Carl Vincent was famous recently because an F-35 crashed on landing um, supposedly the, the pilot uh, was having a um, COVID vaccine initiated myocarditis event at the time. The report that came out afterwards didn't say that. He said he chose a wrong way of uh, approaching the landing. And the, the aircraft went over the side. It's been subsequently recovered. But what's interesting about this photograph, you'll see that all those three F-35Cs there are rusty. And that's because if you have an unstealthy shape, the only way you make it stealthy is to speckle it up with radar absorbent material. And that's based on little tiny iron balls in resin. And you paint this on, make sure it's as smooth as possible. But eventually, of course, in a salty environment, the salt lands on it and, and the um, balls, iron balls rust, and you get rusty looking F-35s. Now also be aware, be much aware, that most missiles miss, especially against modern aircraft that are using countermeasures against uh, radar and infrared. Um, this is a photograph of a QF-4 Phantom. So there's a Phantom put made into a drone use simply to being a flying target. And um, there's an instance of an F-35 shot 
two AIM-120s at it and both missed. Uh, an aircraft presumably that was flying straight and level and horizontal and um, they're quite surprised to have to re-land the QF-4 uh, again. But also that means you have to carry a lot of missiles to be, able, to be sure of shooting down another aircraft. Um, probability of kill is about 0.8%. So if you were in a, a uh, F-35 carrying your standard loadout of two 2,000 pound bombs and two AIM-120s, you have a 0.15 chance, a 15% chance of shooting down another aircraft. It also uh, doesn't stand lightning, it's got to have lightning rods that's sitting outside. How it's going to go in the northern monsoon, the ones parked up at Tyndall, um, we don't know. And requires everything to be perfect. It requires a new air conditioning standard and it requires 600 volt power supply to be able to even turn on on the ground. Pricing. So the last deal done on the F-35 was Canadian government after many years decided to take 88 of them at a price equivalent to 230 million Aussie each. And they've said that the cost over the whole life of each plane will be uh, 70 billion for the lot, which works out to 859 billion per plane for F-35. The same as we're getting. I don't think we're gonna get anything cheaper. However, if you go online and ask Google, what is the price of the F-35? It'll tell you it's 79 billion US. And that's the output there. This is the US uh, Government Accountability Office uh, data that I've quoted and I made up my own graph there of how pricing has evolved over time from the first one sold in 2001 up to 2022 with the, the last one's 23, which is the Canadian number. It started around about 70 million US. It's now up to 160 over 20 years. And how they achieve that, how you can have two prices that are correct at the same time. I call it the Schroeder's duality of F-35 pricing. So 79 million will get you basically the airframe, the engine and the avionics. Probably not even hydraulic oil in the, in the <laughs> hydraulics. And then as you add the other things, you get the flyaway cost, which is 161 million. Now this uh, graph reminds me of being on the net and you're asked to prove that you're human by ticking a box that all things that aren't something. So this is a training for when it asks you, tick all the boxes of things that aren't fighter aircraft. So there's the Hornet in the top left hand corner, carries four 2,000 pound bombs. It was basically designed to be the replacement for the A6 intruder. The F117 doesn't have a gun, carries two 2,000 bombs internally. There was an instance in the first Iraq war when an F-117 over Baghdad dropped its bomb, was guiding it down to its target, and then an Iraqi fighter aircraft appeared underneath about 1,000 foot lower. And the pilot did briefly put his point, laser pointer on the Iraqi aircraft and it would have been the first fighter shot down by a bomber <laughs> in the modern era. But then he went back to his normal target. F-111 was a great aircraft. Unfortunately... It wasn't designed for maintenance, had a very high maintenance of about 80 hours per uh, hour of flight, which made it expensive to operate. That is also the reason why the F-14 Tomcat was retired early. It still had hours, plenty of hours left on the um, airframes in the US Navy, but they retired them early because it was 72 hours of maintenance per hour of flight. Some idiotic decisions were made. For the main access pallet on the F-14, just ahead of the pilot, required three different size wrenches to take it off instead of just one. And then there's the F-35, which is also designed to carry 2,000 pound bombs. Now what you're told is stealth is very important, which is possibly true, but another way of getting that is using electronic countermeasures in the aircraft. Pioneered by the French uh, with a system called Spectra in the Rafale, it simply senses all the electronic transmissions around the aircraft, figures out what's what, what's being emitted, and then sets out, sets out a signal, the pilot's not aware of this of course, sets out a signal, basically either strengthening it or offsetting it, slightly out of phase, and then the aircraft disappears from the other counterparty's radar screen. It's worked very well for the French. The Gripen has a similar a, a structure um, in the canoe fairings on the end of the wings that operate this electronic countermeasures. So the Americans, for the F-15EX, have this thing called e-pause, 
and you can see all the components there. It's about $15 million US per aircraft to install all its stuff. And there's plenty of room in the F-15 for all this sort of equipment. But the F-15, we have to be aware that it was originally designed as an interceptor of Soviet bombers, and therefore it's designed to fly fast and straight, not turn all that much. And this is the F-22 um, manoeuvre en envelope at 5 Gs, as opposed to the F-15's manoeuvre envelope. If you want to survive incoming missiles, you want to be as manoeuvrable as possible. And thus instantaneous turn rate and sustained turn rate are, are very important. And why will displace the F-35? It's got an operating cost of around 28,000 US an hour. The Japanese have configured uh, F-15s to carry up to 18 missiles, uh, um, AIM-120s at once. It's a, it's a big missile truck, as opposed to the F-22, it's now at 85,000 an hour. So we had all these Hornets, um, and the government's replacing them with indecent haste with the F-35. And you're wondering now, what happened to our Hornets? Well. The first 25 went off to Canada, which also operates a type, at 4 million each, Aussie. And then this bloke, Mr. Curlin, photographed there and standing in front of a RAF FADA, um, bought 46 of them, the rest of them. He also got five PC-9 trainers thrown in. Uh, he got a billion US worth of spare parts. He's now got the largest private air force in the world. He runs a thing called um, US Air. And as he said, he bought an Air Force in a box. Um, none were kept for display in Australia. The people who run the RWF are just wacko about, they just want new shiny stuff. They don't want stuff hanging around that's old. If you wanted to be safe, you would have said, well, let's operate the F-35 for a number of years and see how it settles down and keep these things in storage. Anyway. But he has a interesting observation there that I've put in quotes there. Curlin hopes to fit their F-5s, which is a Northrop F-5, the first flew in 959, with infrared search and track, which will be a huge force multiplier for other aggressors flying alongside them and a real threat to stealthy blue air, which is US Air Force, uh, jets like the F-35, F-22, B-2. So he's saying, and he's not a stupid person because he's got the world's largest private aircraft, uh, air force, that if you simply put an infrared search and track on the front of a, a fighter aircraft, even at 60 years old, it's a real threat against the F-35. On discussed Chinese aircraft, the Israelis back in the 80s and early 90s decided to make their own fighter aircraft. They have a big military orientation, and the US didn't like that idea because it might enter their sails. And so they told the Israelis to shut down the production of the Lavi, which is a Delta, Delta wing canard. And so the Israelis sold the plans for that to China for 200 million US, and the Chinese had their version, the J-10, flying by 1998. And that's a grip and by comparison. Now, the, the big detail and difference is that the Gripen's got uh, missile rails on the end of its wings. And funny enough, if you put missiles on the end of your wings, and this is um, infrared-guided missiles, there's no increase in drag because you're avoiding the vortices forming off the end of the wingtips. That's the, the larvae on the left, as built by the Israelis, and that's a J-10 on the right, with a diverterless inlet, was, which was developed by Lockheed in 1996. Very similar. Next up for the Chinese, their first stealth aircraft, supposedly. They stole the plans for the F-35 in 2006 and decided to make a copy. I think this flew in 2012. Instead of being single engine, they made twin engine. Uh, but it just tells me that the Chinese actually have no understanding of fighter aircraft design. Because they, the F-35 is short and dumpy and fat and everything for a reason, for that vertical takeoff and landing. They simply copied the whole thing um, without changing much at all. And thus, this thing has an underwhelming performance. This is the first aircraft the Chinese ever designed by themselves. You know, they've never had anything original before that. The MiG-21 copied and the, um, the Larvae copied. They made co illegal copies of the Su-27. And this is the first thing they designed themselves. And it's a dog, absolute dog. <laughs>
The version that has flown couldn't super cruise. Uh, doesn't have a gun, but it's actually designed to carry long-range air-to-air -air missiles. They have a thing called the PL-15 with 300 kilometre range. Um, the AIM-120 probably picks out around 120 kilometres. The Russians have a thing called the uh, R-37M with a range of 300 kilometres, a 600 kilogram air-to-air -air missile. Um, but in detail on why this is a dog, there's a section through the aircraft looking down it on the one side of it. You see a diverterless inlet in the inlet, that's fine. Canted tail, so that it doesn't have a radar reflection in the horizontal, that's fine. But at the bottom of that tail, you'll see a bit sticking out into the airstream at the, at the base of the strake. Seemingly that's at the part of the mechanism for the all-moving tail. Instead of having a, a bit that's hanging off the back, that the whole tail moves, which means you're not having as much material there hanging in the wind. Uh, tails, until you need them, just cause drag all the time, so to minimise them as much as possible. But having that bulb bulge there is um, idiotic. Now I've got the canard coming away from the um, body of the aircraft, at the same plane as the wing, wing effectively. Now canards are good, but canards should be above the main wing and the rear end of the canard should be just at the forward leading edge of the main wing. Um, having that orientation means the canard's uh, causing too much drag. It's reducing the lift over the main wing instead of being additive. As opposed to the effort the French put into having their canards at the right elevation above the main wing on the Rafale. As you can see, they built these big shoulders so that the canards could sit on. And that's fine, there's probably no extra drag associated with that. And Bert Rutan um, built up, he's known for his canards, but to just put as an aside from him. The Turks, you may remember in the start of the Ukraine Russia war, that the Bayraktars were doing good work and then they've gone quiet because they're too easy to shoot down. Anyway, made some money out of selling those, got famous, made a drone aircraft fighter. But he also, he's put the canards at the same plane as the main wing, which is a big no-no. Now, not all doom and gloom. The most beautiful fighter aircraft ever built was the F YF-23, which was the Northrop offering up against the uh, Lockheed Martin for the F-22 contract, which became the F-22. And this aircraft obeys the area rule that you want to go supersonic or high transonic, uh, high subsonic, there should be as little change as possible in the cross-sectional area down the length of the aircraft. So it doesn't matter whether it's on the tips of the wings or in the main body, just don't change the total uh, cross-sectional area like this as you go down. It should be as smooth as possible. And this aircraft obeys that uh, quite well. They put the engine's uh, exhaust into a trough at the back to, to reduce the infrared signature. And they built the wingspan so that it came at the Mach angle. So you can see the front has got a triangular uh, nose and that's telling us the thing was optimised to fly at Mach uh, 1.82. So the Mach angle at Mach 2 is 30 degrees, it's 19 degrees at Mach 3. And that Mach angle tells us that this thing was optimised around 1.8 where it can supercruise. This thing was a very slippery aircraft. Now what happened when the F-22 was given the contract by Lockheed it was contracted to have a 1,000 kilometre range and also have contracted to have a specific radar cross-sectional area. But when they kept on designing the thing after being given the contract, it turns out they weren't meeting the radar cross-sectional area, so they had to keep adding RAM to it. And each kilo of RAM you know, takes a couple of kilometres off the range of the aircraft, and so the range of the F-22 is now 720 kilometres, not 1,000 kilometres. A sacrifice range for the radar signature. Um, that's what it looks like down the aircraft and sideways. Now onto our ghost bat. You look at that and that's a good stealthy shape. It maximises the internal volume of the of the aircraft uh, relative to drag and everything. It may yet fail, I have to warn you, because they've decided to say well for each variant, there's about three variants will be made with different nose cones, and you swap the nose cone out depending on what mission it is.
uh, if those things have different weights, that changes the weight distribution in the aircraft. And we're not told, haven't been officially told, what the armament of this thing is. But from a display in India, Air India a couple of years ago, it may be two AIM-120s. And that's drones of others. The Russians, by comparison, have built a whopping great drone based on the Su-57 and uses the same engine. And that's a person standing on the wing for scale. And it can drop full-size bombs. And the Coyote drone. Ah. So I know a bloke called George Spix, who is well up in the US defence establishment. He was on the uh, committee examining the F-16 shoot down over Serbia, for instance. And about a decade ago, he said to me, David, uh, for th anything above the horizon to survive in the future, that's going to have to be very reflective. So what you see here is an F-22 uh, chromed to be very reflective. So the US Air Force knows, uh, the US Department of Defence knows that lasers are coming and um, try to mitigate the effect of that as much as possible. And that's a chromed F-35. The Russians, uh, just about every design of theirs is a good looking aircraft and very efficient. Um, the SU-35 SU is the same weight and size, the F-22 probably uses 10% less fuel per hour of uh, operation than the F-22. What you see here, in the top left, looking away from us, um, you see how the body of the aircraft narrows as you get down to the exhaust, and that's because they're keeping the cross-sectional area the same uh, as you go down the length of the aircraft and the wings widen out. And that's the aerial law. F-16. Um, US Air Force hasn't bought them for decades, but they're bought by a lot of US operators in the Middle East, and they all come like this, with these weapon grab conformal fuel tanks. And that's because the original designers of the, F of the F-16 knew that the tendency of the Air Force was, if there was space available in the fuselage, they would chuck more stuff in it, and um, especially for ground attack. And to stop that from happening, they made the fuselage as small as possible. Um, which also, they also made the fuel tank as small as possible because in those days the F-16 was going to take off from somewhere in Germany and it would be fighting Soviet aircraft within minutes of taking off because they're only a few hundred kilometres away. So you didn't need a big aircraft, you needed a light aircraft. But that results in all the new ones being sold with conformable uh, fuel tanks. Also George Spix told me that the, um, the general in charge of the F-16 development wanted a good looking aircraft. So the SATCOM was put down be in the fuselage behind the aircraft, uh, behind the pilot. Was, you know, remember the canopy of the F-16 comes down and there's this flat space? Well, they could have had the SATCOM sitting up higher and that would meant over Serbia uh, for the pilots to communicate with the US. They had to fly at about a 30 degree bank because, because the uh, satellites do the communication over the equator. So they had to fly along like this so the SATCOM could work. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>